No, sorry I couldn't join you as, as your escort committee, but no, no, thanks no, for coming that's out. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. So, as many of you might know, Senator Stabenow is from the state of Michigan. She has. Let's give it up for Michigan. <laughs> She has been a senator, a uh, Democratic senator, uh, since 2001. Before that, she was in the House. I think you came in in 1997, correct? Yep, I did. She was the first woman Michigan ever sent to the Senate. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> all right, you've got a fan club here. Uh, since that time, she's risen in the ranks. She's become the chair of the Senate Agriculture Committee. Right. And she's also a member of Senate Democratic leadership. Right, right now, she's the chairwoman of the Democratic Policy and Communications Committee, which does um, a lot of the messaging for her caucus. So I want to start with the news of the day question. Yes. We have a lot to cover. We're going to start with yes. the news of the day. Yes. Tonight, obviously, Vice President Harris is going yes. to formally accept the nomination. It's the culmination of a pretty stunning series of events oh my gosh. where you had one torch that was passed down to another. And you're preparing to pass your own torch. You are about to retire at the end of a nearly 25-year career. So I want to know how you're feeling about this moment and this convention and this candidate where you saw a torch pass from one generation of Democratic leadership to another. Well, it's, it's wonderful to be here with you. And um, I've been to a lot of conventions. This is incredibly exciting. And in some ways, uh, nostalgic for me because um, this is the last one for me as a senator. So, um, but I think it's so important that we recognize that moving forward is step by step by step. You know, I think of Hillary Clinton. I, I remember 2016, how we all felt. Uh, at the convention and so on, and how heartbroken we were at, at, at the results, and then horrified afterwards <laughs> about what happened. But to see Hillary this week, who was brilliant on stage, speak about breaking you know, the cracks in the uh, glass ceiling and so on, and then to know that she is literally, she's opened the door for Kamala Harris. She's passing the torch to Kamala Harris. Somebody has to, Somebody has to show the face first. Like the, a president can look like this, look like a woman. Mm -hmm. Somebody on a debate stage for president can look like a woman, and she did that. I, in my own life, um, not because I was planning this, but um, I've been actually in politics in, uh, po a long time in Michigan. And um, in 1994, as a state senator, I was the first woman to run statewide. I ran for governor, narrowly lost. Uh, but the same thing, it was like a face could look like mm. the governor. And, yeah. and so, but eight years later, and for, for Kamala, it's eight years after Hillary. Uh, for, in Michigan, it was eight years after I ran. Oh. Jennifer Granholm was elected the first uh, governor of Michigan. And then now we have uh, Gretchen Whitmer, who's so terrific. And we have a woman governor, a woman secretary of state, a woman attorney general, senior senator. Somebody asked me, do we allow men to run in Michigan? And I said, only if they're qualified. So, <laughs> so but, but the truth is, people have to feel comfortable seeing power as the face of a woman. And I really, we're there now. We're absolutely there now. And so I hope this is gonna be about how she's ready to step in. She's ready to go. Yeah. She's qualified. She's got the right policy, certainly for Michigan. And yeah. um, this is somebody who will make a great president. Yeah, so tell me how she's doing in Michigan. Where's your yeah. sense of where they stand? And you know, you've won statewide in Michigan yourself. What does, right. she have, what does she have to do to win that state? Well, she's doing it. And um, even before coming in as the presidential candidate, I think this year alone, she's been in Michigan six times before this even happened. And so um, she and President Biden both. What we are seeing to win Michigan, it's short term and long term. The pieces that have been put together to keep people safe and alive and get rid, you know, get away from COVID and kids back to school and all those things that happened. Then we transitioned into how do we create a strong economy? Mm -hmm. Bringing jobs home, uh, rebuilding America, uh, focusing on science, tackling the climate crisis, all these things. Very important, foundation. But what she's doing is the next step as well, which is so important. So how does it work for you and your family right now? Right. What does that look like? Affordable housing is critical for people in Michigan. Um, making sure you not only have 
job, but it's a good paying job. Mm -hmm. uh, keeping health care costs going down. Taking what we've done for the drug companies, taking them on for seniors and making that available for everybody else. And there's a whole range of things that go to your costs right now. Mm -hmm. Your food costs, your health care costs, your medicine. And that's the next step right. that she's taking. So, and then another Michigan question, clearly the state's home to this major auto manufacturing sure. economy, the labor force is contending with the transition over to right. making electric vehicles. EVs have become, you know, sort of uh, this part of really, you know, it's become a culture war issue. Right. right? The, the way, the way uh, folks are talking about it on the other side of the aisle. What's your sense of where Michiganders stand on the transition to EVs and, and how important do you think it is that Vice President Harris is going to have to thread that needle in her campaign? Well, let me just say, this whole thing is weird. I mean, this is one of the weird things in that moving to clean energy and new jobs has become this big political issue. In my judgment, it is because behind all of this, the oil companies are terrified that we are not going to stay on fossil fuels. And so they've done 50 years of trying to convince people there wasn't a climate crisis, and then now EVs won't work, and just it's on and on and on. And their allies in the House and Senate have done everything they can to try to make sure the consumer tax credit is too complicated to use. That all the things that we've put in place, you know, that, that we're not doing charging stations as fast as we could. I mean, to undermine people's confidence, there's a whole undermining that in some ways is working. Now, I can tell you, I have an EV, Chevy Volt, made in Lake Orion, Michigan, All right. that I love, and haven't gone to a gas station in two and a half <coughs> years. And I'm not interested in going back and doing that. And once you realize I've got a charger in my garage in Michigan, but in DC, there's, there's charging stations. Once people really see this, both as a cost savings, as making a contribution to the 30% of the climate crisis, which is transportation, right. but innovation and jobs. And so the other thing I would say is these EVs are going to be driven in body in Michigan. The question is, will they be Chinese made or American made? Chinese made. Chinese are banking them. They've stolen a lot of our patents over the years, I can tell you. But they, you know, they have leaned in on cheap Chinese vehicles. They're already in Europe. They're coming to, the, they're trying to come to the United States. So there are going to be new types of vehicles. Are we going to make them in America or are we going to let China do it? And so this administration says, let's make it in America. Do you think that that message still needs to break through in Michigan, or do you think Michiganders get it? I think there's still work to do, but it's a whole lot better than it was. Got it. Um, we've got battery plants being opened in Michigan. And by the way, when we've done tax cuts for clean energy, they're called production tax credits, which is a very big deal. It's been right. a big thing that I have focused on. You get the tax cut if you produce it in America. You don't get the tax cut, and then you can take the jobs overseas to make it. You get the solar production tax credit, battery production tax credit. We've got, we've got 44 new facilities opening in Michigan, most related to clean energy. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen that in decades. And it's related to a policy of investing in America, growing the middle class, making it in America. I mean, that's, that's the vision. And as people see this, I think there's going to be more and more enthusiasm. Right. So in the time we have left, I have to ask you about the farm bill. Yeah, what? <laughs> I'd be in big trouble if I didn't ask you about I know, the farm bill. I know. What's going on with the farm bill? I'm doing, you know, I've been involved in six farm bills, mm -hmm. as you know, this third one I've led. It's always bipartisan. We've always been able to keep, you know, partisan politics out of this mm -hmm. process, but it's getting harder and harder and harder to do. So um, I'm doing everything I can before the end of the year. I put forward my own uh, bill, section by section uh, bill. The House passed a bill. The committee passed a bill. Unfortunately, they passed something that um, it takes money off the nutrition title, which we never do, and uh, doesn't, you know, skewed to the South and the Midwest is not happy. I've, if I voted for the House bill, I'd get killed by my commodity groups because uh, wheat, corn, soybeans, everything in the Midwest gets the short end of the stick. So bottom line, um, 
we need to sit down and negotiate and be serious. Um, and right now, folks uh, on the Republican side want to spend more money than there is. I'm happy to do that if we can get a bipartisan way to figure that out. CBO says even with nutrition cuts, the House bill has a deficit of $33 billion. And they can't pass it in the House. They can't pass it in the House mm -hmm. floor because of that. Yeah. So let's get together, agree on uh, the bipartisan way we're going to raise the money. I'm for raising as much as we can to meet the needs of ag. Agriculture needs certainty. We need a bill. Agriculture needs certainty. Families need certainty. Yeah. And, but folks need to understand how you do that. I've been around a long time. I know how you do this. It's a broad coalition of farm folks, family, food, hunger folks, conservation, biofuels, forestry. I mean, it's a, and you gotta get everybody. Yeah. Livestock, um, and not just your own pet crop that you grow. You have to support all parts of agriculture. And we don't yet see a recognition or willingness yeah. to negotiate so, to do that. Yeah, so time is running out. Have, have there been any talks during the recess? Oh, we, we talk all the time. Yeah, we, you, we, you, we, you we and your try, counterpart, we, Senator Bozeman, we, talk? We, uh, our staffs are talking. We've yet to get anything written down as a proposal. We, we hear concerns about our bill, but I've had no on paper proposals on the other side. So we're trying to say, let's start there. Mm -hmm. We need to do that. Uh, it appears they're uh, deferring to the House that doesn't have the votes to pass their bill. And so I keep going, okay, if you're deferring over here and it can't pass, what's your plan B? <laughs> yeah. Because we need a farm bill. We need a fa yeah. Farmers need a farm bill. Families need a farm bill. But it's not just, you know, if they say more farm in the farm bill, but they have a farm bill with more farm in the farm bill for a few. How? And that's not enough. So this, is, this would be your last farm bill. Mm -hmm. So what are your top priorities? What don't you want to leave on the table in passing this last farm bill? Well, this, Ho hoping I mean, that you can really get important. it done. Yeah, it's really important we have a five-year bill, that it is fair for um, uh, all kinds of crops, that we listen to farmers who say their number one risk management tool is crop insurance. And not, enough, in my opinion, is being done there. We need to. We know there's more input costs. We know we need to, to address costs. Um, I represent a state that has more diversity than any state but California, and we grow a lot of fruits and vegetables, mm -hmm. what we call specialty crops, mm -hmm. who have, until recently, until I push like crazy, um, were totally left out of the farm bill. And so I want to make sure they are getting support. Frankly, we need a moonshot on research in this country, agricultural research. You know, we see uh, a whole range of things coming that relate to the climate that, that we need to have better tools on. Um, and speaking of the climate, you know, we need to be giving our farmers all the tools that they need around conservation and other tools to continue to be leaders in what we do on carbon sequestration and other issues on the climate. So I want to do that. Um, at the same time, you know, we, we will be you know, focus on other issues as they come up. But this is, you know, where the, I don't think we have an economy in our country unless somebody makes something and somebody grows something. That's what we do in Michigan. And the agricultural economy, food industry, production, and so on, is a huge part of the jobs in this country. And we may not think a lot about it when you go to the grocery store, but mm -hmm. somebody actually grew that food. It didn't magically appear. Mm -hmm. And so, so we need to understand that and have the best support uh, for them that we can. Well, we'll all be watching and waiting and seeing what happens with the farm bill between now and the end of the year. Uh, unfortunately, it's all the time we have for, but I so enjoyed our conversation. My, my Thank you so much for being here with my us. Pleasure. Senator Sabanow. My pleasure. So.